A stable and prosperous Afghanistan is in the best interests of the region and the globe. This is something that's easier said than done. It's been many years now that Pakistan and the United States have been cooperating with each other in the region in order to achieve success in the Afghan problem. This alliance has brought before the two partners a number of challenges and that too quite a few times. What is the future of this cooperation now that there is lots of noise about divergence of interests? Is it possible for Pakistan to play a pivotal role in the pursuit of stability in Afghanistan and at the same time safeguard its own interests in the region? And again, what are the United States' expectations from Pakistan as it tries to ensure durable settlement in Afghanistan? All of that is trending tonight here on the platform. Welcome, I'm your host, Vakas Rafiq in the Islamabad studios of Express 24-7. And to uh, take part in the conversation, I have a panel of uh, distinguished guests. With me here in the Islamabad studios is Mr. Tanvir Ahmad Khan, a familiar face here on the platform. He's the former Foreign Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Khan, for joining us. And in the Karachi, um, from Karachi, I'm being joined by Ms. Sherry Rahman. She is the former information minister and is also president of uh, the Jinnah Institute and her institute, let us uh, tell you, has uh, very recently published a report that's titled Pakistan, the United States and the End Game in Afghanistan, Perceptions of Pakistan's Foreign Policy Elite. Welcome uh, Ms. Rehman, I'm glad you could join us uh, tonight. Let's cross over to Washington DC now where my colleague from Voice of America, Raza Nakfi, is waiting with his guest. Hi Raza. Hi Vakas and welcome viewers to Voice of America, the Washington studios. I'm Raza Nakvi. Afghanistan remains one of the biggest foreign policy challenges for the United States as well as for Pakistan. But do the US and Pakistan have competing interests when it comes to the future of this historically volatile country? To discuss this, we have with us uh, Ahmad Majidyar, an Afghanistan expert at the American Enterprise Institute. But we're going to begin in uh, Karachi, actually, and begin with Ms. Sherry Rahman, uh, who's only with us for the top portion of the show. Uh, Ms. Rahman, uh, as Vakas mentioned, you have uh, your uh, Jinnah Institute recently put out this report about Pakistan's foreign policy elite and their perceptions of Afghanistan. I want to get your view on this and uh, sort of give, give, uh, f give our viewers a sense of what came out of that report, particularly when it comes to Pakistan. Pakistan's policy elites thinking of U.S. policy in Afghanistan. Mr. Rahman? Mr. Rahman, can you hear me? This is, uh, we are asking uh, your uh, institute's policy about uh, Okay, I think we are having some technical difficulties with Mr. Rahman. Uh, let's begin the discussion um, with you, Mr. Majidyar. Um, now, you know, an interesting piece of news that's come out of um, the Afghanistan-U.S. relationship in recent times is this uh, talk of uh, an agreement uh, to extend the... Uh, stay of U.S. combat operations in Afghanistan past 2014. Uh, the Daily Telegraph of UK recently said that it could even be up till 2024. Um, now this agreement is still under discussion and there's a lot of um, uh, things that still have to be worked out. But tell us very generally what would in this sort of agreement entail and why would the U.S. and Afghanistan seek to have an agreement that would extend uh, U.S. presence in Afghanistan past the current 2014 uh, what people say is the deadline. Yes, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, the discussions over this strategic agreement between the United States and Afghanistan are underway, and we do not know the exact details of the agreement as of yet. Right. And indeed, uh, the uh, National Security Advisor of Afghanistan, uh, Rangin Dodfer Spanta, is coming uh, next week. Mr. Majid, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off there very quickly. Uh, we, we've reestablished linked with Karachi, uh, and we just have to quickly um, uh, ask Ms. Rahman to participate in the discussion. Uh, Ms. Sherry Rahman, we're talking uh, today about Afghanistan and Pakistan and especially the U.S. role regarding this topic. Uh, I just wanted to get your per, uh, perspective and uh, get you to tell our viewers what came out of that report specifically with regards to Pakistan's view of U.S. policy in Afghanistan. 
Right. Thank you very much. I, I, sorry I didn't hear at least the entire middle part of your question, but I'm assuming you're asking what uh, I'm talking about, which is uh, the reaction of Pakistan. And, and we're really talking of policy elites, the community that has a stake in policy making, that has experience in uh, U.S. processes and thinking. And really, um, unsurprisingly, we have seen that while there was a great deal of uh, consternation, anxiety, and worry about the lack of clarity in American policies uh, with regard to the end game, um, there was never any question of uh, seeking investment in a strategic disconnect. In fact, quite the opposite, there was value seen in bringing convergences to joint objectives such as stability in Afghanistan, such as seeking uh, an end game that is politically, that politically reconciles uh, competing factions. And of course, uh, you know, Pakistan's own interests are linked to uh, a, a stable and peaceful Afghanistan. I think so. These are the important points. But again, there was a great deal of consternation, I must emphasize, on the lack of clarity, the dissonance also between objectives, defined stated objectives of political reconciliation and a military operation that has run a course of 10 years and seems to, why, you know, there is concession that Taliban capacity has been degraded a little, um, seems to not have succeeded in bringing uh, the insurgents and militants to the table in a manner that would have uh, been, um, would have made all stakeholders uh, define the, the end game, perhaps to the advantage of uh, non-insurgent um, uh, ends. So really what I'm saying is, in, in other words, the, the fighting still continues, the Taliban's capacity to push and pose military challenges still uh, is very much uh, obvious and, 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 and they retain that capacity. The audacity and outreach of their attacks, in fact, on Pakistan are increasing, as you note. So Pakistani concerns are uh, very, very uh, clear. They seek some uh, clarity and they also see interagency confusion in, uh, in, in the United States, not that we don't have us, but we see a much more confusion there about uh, in different centers of power. Yet the defined objective of a political outcome uh, and stabilization is fast proving elusive. Uh, uh, and we feel that, you know, asking Pakistan to do more or act on, on insurgents uh, that target the United States is very valid. But the point is, that Pakistan is under attack even um, by its own, uh, on its own soil, by the militants such as the TTP that target it. And there is a capacity argument to be made, obviously, that Pakistan's forces are stretched thin. Uh, and obviously, there is a commitment argument to be made, which is really uh, how at this stage, when the United States also wants to speak and start talking two elements of the Taliban, which will include uh, it, those that have opposed right. and attacked it naturally, how can right. it ask Pakistan to attack those same elements? Because Pakistan will be left in the region with the baby and the bathwater and, of course, the tub once again. Right. So there Mr. Is Mr. Rahman, that, if, if yes. I could... If I could ask you this question as well, I mean, you talk about uh, how Pakistan sees a lack of clarity with regard to U.S. interests and U.S. objectives in, uh, in Afghanistan. A question is often raised of Pakistan's interests and Pakistan's objectives, and your report speaks a little bit to this. Can you give us some more details about that? What did these elites say about what Pakistan is looking for in Afghanistan? Yes, uh, as I, I want to very clearly state that these are not my institutional, uh, this is not my view or my institutional view, but it's um, clearly 54 people with high stakes in this endgame. And they are saying that Pakistan's interests are best served by a strategic outcome uh, of a reconciliation that is a government that is inclusive, number one, that is obviously that comes through a political process. Uh, number two, 
uh, and a political process that doesn't exclude the stakeholders. Uh, and and really, Pakistan seeks stability and and and, and that this process of reconciliation and government formation, ex- inclusive government formation, that doesn't exclude any key, you know, ethnic groups and uh, other stakeholders, uh, must be Afghan-led. So this is not a harking back to the 1990s. There is uh, a very clear line between that, uh, and there's a shift from that in Pakistan's view, that we are not seeking that kind of engagement where we were obviously and correctly criticized for we right. for looking at Afghanistan as you, a big backyard. We just want safety. You talk about uh, the state. Yeah. You talk about stakeholders and uh, people, uh, stakeholders and inclusiveness. Uh, I just want to get you quickly. I mean, you, you also say that uh, we don't want to return to the 90s. Pakistan doesn't want to return to the 90s. The question then becomes: What did these elites have to say about what role the Taliban? should and would play in a uh, in an ideal scenario for Pakistan see there's a sense of being stuck with the Taliban the Taliban in government is obviously not an option that uh, anyone would favor uh, as as the perfect outcome clearly uh, Afghanistan has has uh, obviously certainly the north and many parts of the center have moved away from uh, many years of Taliban rule. There are human rights interests that are that are now held, and other services on the ground. There are social services on the ground, uh, which is not to say that the Taliban obviously mitigate that, but there is worry about um, women's rights and other human rights. Uh, and Pakistan also feels that um, it must not interfere beyond a point. It must. Uh, what Pakistan is seeking is an Afghan-led process which does not exclude any ethnicity uh, because we are seeking stability on our border. As you know, our very long forest uh, Durand line is not policed in by, you know, by conventional patrols or security checks, either from the ISAF side, uh, even though we have offered many times to secure it better, uh, but it is mostly uh, guarded and, and kept stable by tribal conventions and uh, if we start to attack all the tribes available on that border we will be left with no friends and a lot of scorched earth when the United States draws down all its forces in 2014. We are aware that they will be keeping bases, I mean they didn't make the bases for you and me to play cricket on, so they will be retaining interest, they will be retaining um, surveillance, they will be retaining some kind of uh, formal non-military presence and there is worry naturally that, that those areas will then be used for increased CT or counter-terrorism uh, surge which we are seeing lately which is really uh, translated into drone operations. Right. So there are these worries. Right. Vakas, go ahead. I think legitimate anxieties. Yeah, I just wanted to use this opportunity, uh, Ms. Rahman, and I uh, want to ask you, how has Pakistan, according to your views, been responding to the Afghan problem recently? Well, I think Pakistan has been very measured in its responses. Uh, it has not taken uh, instant uh, inflammatory reaction. Uh, we, we have seen recently the Afghan ambassador, the envoy was summoned to the uh, foreign office when uh, the attacks have uh, intensified from across the border, mostly from, you know, we saw the whole summer of attacks increasing into Upper the Lower Deal and other areas into Pakistan. Uh, and uh, the, as I said, the audacity, outreach, and uh, firepower available and, and, the, and the time available to, to, to the attackers, the footprint shows us that many of these um, insurgents attacking into Pakistan from sanctuaries in Afghanistan were uh, those that had fled from the uh, Malakand operation. They used much more sophisticated ordnance and weaponry than they left Pakistan with. So it is a great cause of anxiety that when we conduct operations, when we scorch our earth, displace hundreds of thousands of people and uh, you know, take away, uh, lose an entire generation to this internal displacement and conflict. Uh, we pay a very high human price in military and civilian yes. casualties, Indeed. and there we have these people returning 
from sanctuary. So, yes, so really, uh, the two countries need to cooperate better on this. Very briefly on the same thing, the cooperation between the two countries. Now, there's been lots of talk going on, Ms. Rahman. I'm sure you're aware of the divergence uh, of interest between Pakistan and United States. Yet, Pakistan has its own strategic interests in the region. Uh, quite a dilemma there for Pakistan. How do you see um, Pakistan-U.S. Uh, cooperation shaping up in Afghanistan in uh, the uh, times to come then? Really, we have a very good question. We, as I said, we have important gains and joint objectives in stabilizing Afghanistan because I strongly believe that uh, Afghanistan cannot be stabilized without the cooperation of these two. Uh, I mean, the United States is really the largest and by far um, the, the biggest um, uh, elephant in the room. We are a much smaller one, but our uh, footprint is obviously is lighter and it is it is needed in the long run simply because all pakistan is worried about is stability in its uh, region unlike playing uh, for heavy stakes and that like as we did in the 1990s and my point is that if the united states wants a stability it wants political reconciliation it wants Afghanistan not to go into, uh, you know, not to sort of ricochet into flames after investing so much blood and treasure in 10 years of a conflict, then really we will have to think this through, that the bit about fighting and talking has to be kind of bifurcated. There will have to be a cessation of hostilities like there is in every post-insurgent or post-conflict situation, be it big or small, and there will have to be room created for all players to yes. feel that they are not cut out and that their interests are protected. Right. When Pakistan says its interests need to be protected, basically we want stability on our, in our, on our uh, um, western border, which we are seeing, yes. seeing burn, turn into flames as we speak. And it's a very legitimate anxiety. And I think what would be best finally is for the for American policy circles to calibrate their policy by understanding that Pakistan's motives are really uh, driven by right. anxiety, not um, ambition. Yes. So it's anxiety, not ambition. Yes, and there's a question, I believe, for yeah. you uh, from Mr. Majid Yar, who is in Washington D.C. Right, Reza? Yeah, uh, Vakas, uh, Mr. Majidia, you've heard uh, some of the things Mr. Rahman had to say. How would you uh, respond and would you have anything to ask of her as well? Yes, as uh, Mr. Rahman mentioned, that there is lack of clarity and also long-term commitment to the end game in Afghanistan, especially she talked about the reconciliation with the Taliban. And I absolutely agree with her that there is some ambiguity in the U.S. policy in that regard. But uh, what uh, Ms. Rahman didn't speak about is about lack of clarity in Pakistan's policy uh, in terms of the end game and also reconciliation of the Talib, uh, ta with the Taliban in Afghanistan because publicly we, we see that the Pakistani politicians m mentioned that the Pakistan's objective is a stable, inclusive and uh, peaceful Afghanistan. But on the other hand, we see that at the same time, uh, the certain elements within the military and the ISR, they are supporting the Taliban, the Haqqani group and the Quetta Shura, who are de destabilizing Afghanistan. So right. uh, there, there is a conflict uh, in that regard as well. And how she would explain that? Yes, Mr. Manas, let's, uh, let's ask that question of you. Go ahead. I have alluded to it in, in one of my earlier uh, uh, questions when I spoke to a larger question. Uh, as I said, there is no confusion in Pakistan right now about commitment. There is certainly a major capacity issue, and uh, my, uh, some of the respondents in our report also suggest that at a time when the United States is, I mean, there are even rumors that the United States is speaking or seeking to speak to the Haqqanis, and they have them in a room which, in which Pakistan is not included, then really Pakistan will have to look to uh, who protects or covers their back. I think this is a very important anxiety to understand. Uh, when you ask Pakistan, we are, not, we are not providing or looking at providing sanctuary or succor or comfort to any militant that uh, challenges uh, our uh, 
the writ of a sovereign state. We are a sovereign state and we will obviously support the process of sovereignty, nation building and democracy in Afghanistan. And we will support the right. United States in doing so. <clears throat> However, there is no question that while the United States is not able to clarify what security stabilization arrangements it will leave behind in its uh, wake, we cannot, uh, even with, say, completely, you know, more and more value-added capacity, Pakistan cannot afford to burn every bridge it will need, especially when the, Uni the United States is also involved or seeking to reconcile with elements it is telling Pakistan to uh, attack. So there is, you know, we, we are really, really waiting for the dots to connect in U.S. policy, uh, and we will be better... Um, informed we will right. make uh, clearer decisions but we are fighting a war in our own homeland uh, sure. against our Mr. own Mr. Imam, uh, thank you so much uh, for you. for uh, th thank you so much for uh, giving us uh, this interesting perspective of the Pakistan foreign policy elite and some of your own uh, comments as well Vakas, uh, i believe you uh, want to uh, take the take over and uh, speak with your guests exactly Exactly, Rez. I just want to bring in uh, Mr. Tanvir Ahmed Khan, and he's been listening to all the comments that have been made. Uh, again, I want to start with you from the same thing that Ms. Rehman also highlighted. 25 soldiers were killed just recently when over 200 Taliban militants crossed over from Afghanistan and killed uh, Pakistani soldiers inside uh, Chitral. And this has not happened for the first time, and it is happening at a time, Mr. Khan, when the end game in Afghanistan has already begun. So, of course, uh, con creates lots of confusions for the ordinary Pakistanis. And also, Ms. Rahman, in her last reply, just said to what Mr. Majidia was saying, that Pakistan cannot afford to burn all the bridges. How do you look at all of this? Well, uh, the specific episode, uh, incident that you mentioned, in which there has been a heavy loss of life uh, on the Pakistani side of the border, 25 or more scouts have died. Now, I think this is typical uh, of the situation that prevails in this part of the world at the moment. And uh, we, we, uh, there was a lot of discussion about divergences. Now, let me, let me just in passing say that personally I do not think that this period in which there are divergences, explicit divergences, that it is bad. In fact, I think it's a gain, because we had a long period uh, from 2001 onwards when the U.S.-Pakistan relationship, particularly when Jal Musharraf was in power, was really undefined. And the working assumption on the American side was uh, we are uh, the policy makers, we drive the policy, Pakistan is the state that implements, that, that com provides compliance with our strategic uh, intentions and, and plans. And Pakistan's voice wasn't really registering anywhere. Now, during that period, I think a basic flaw developed. The basic flaw was that many people in the American strategic community, and I think it did influence decision making in the Bush era and even subsequently, I think they uh, thought that they could ignore geography or geopolitics altogether. The initial onslaught of Afghanistan had done the same, but in population terms, in human terms. Uh, the, uh, Kabul was captured by the Northern Alliance, and, and they were the foot soldiers of the invasion. And that led to a situation which later on had to be rectified, and it was never completely rectified. The situation was that these non-Pashtun uh, ethnic forces that came from the north, they completely overturned the Afghan state of the last 240 years and turned it into a, a kind of anti-Pashtun or non-Pashtun uh, state, which led to the re-emergence of the Taliban as partly a religious force and partly as a nationalist uh, force. That's right. Uh, so uh, that also... Now, uh, to come to this, yeah. the, the incident, the incident that you, I think it needs a little analysis. All right. Uh, more recently, uh, the main thrust of Pakistan's policy has been to uh, develop a strong relationship with Karzai government. 
and there has been considerable success coming and going and I think there is a broad consensus between Pakistan, between Islamabad and Kabul on how to proceed further. Now when this kind of incident takes place, uh, in Pakistan there will be one or two questions that will be asked. One would be, uh, is Mr. Karzai really in charge? I mean, is he really effectively in control uh, of the entire situation? Or are there elements within the Afghan government that encourage uh, the kind of incursion that costs Pakistan um, th these very precious lives? The other is that this the morphology of the attack. Now, we, we have known it. This, this is a particularly sensitive area, Arandu Chitral. It figured in between Pakistan and Afghanistan way back in uh, early 50s as well. It's a vulnerable area. It's an area which can be attacked from the from Nuristan on the other side. Now there there is a time lead in which uh, these lashkars assemble. Mm. Then they are re-equipped mm. because, uh, as was pointed out earlier, when they left Pakistan, they might have carried uh, the odd guns, mm. but they had no other sophisticated weapons that, like the ones that they used right. this time. So uh, there was all the time for uh, the ISF. All the Americans, uh, all the Afghans, to uh, pick up intelligence on that and to try to disperse them. I mean, the Americans have no presence on in Nuristan. And you feel that it. that area was not no, the focus no. of the and, and uh, that, security that forces that in Afghanistan. That points to certain right. sort of a, a degree of ambivalence right. towards Pakistan. And, which uh, we'll of course get comments on uh, what you just said from uh, Washington D.C. and also many other issues uh, that are part of this uh, uh, topic that we are discussing today on the platform. That's uh, Pakistan and United States cooperation in Afghanistan. Stay with us. We'll be right back. to the platform we're today talking about Afghanistan, the United States and Pakistan and the convergence or divergence of interests uh, of all those three countries. Um, I want to bring my guest Mr. Ahmed Majidia into the discussion. Mr. Majidia, before the break we were talking a little bit about this particular incident that took place a few days ago where um, the Pakistan army says 25 Pakistani frontier corpsmen were killed by a cross-border attack from Afghanistan into Pakistan. Now, I just want to get your view on this. Now, we haven't heard much from the Afghan government with regards to this uh, attack. How does the Afghan government look at this? What sort of response would they have to this, uh, to this incident? Well, I think that the incident, uh, the recent is incident is a great lesson both for the Afghan government and also for uh, the Pakistani government because the insurgents who crossed the border uh, off Afghanistan and killed many uh, inside Pakistan. Uh, they are a network of many different militant groups. Uh, primarily, they are from the uh, Tahrik and Nefaz Shariat Muhammadi, who established the Taliban rule in Swat some years ago. So, this is a great lesson that the appeasement of the Taliban and uh, also uh, striking short term deals with them will not help because they are the same militants that the Pakistani government had agreement with them and now they are uh, in Afghanistan and crossing the border and attacking the Pakistani state. So, so this is a time that both the Afghan government and the Pakistani government should understand that this is a common enemy and join hands to just fight these forces and the selective policy of just appeasing some Taliban groups while supporting the, uh, while fighting against the other uh, would not help Pakistan. But doesn't this also speak to sort of the difficulty of going after these groups? I mean, Pakistan has long maintained that uh, it simply doesn't have the capacity to go into all the areas that the United States demands. It doesn't have uh, the uh, necessary uh, troops available for this. It's also just very difficult because there's a th threat of blowback. Doesn't this also speak to some of the difficulties uh, that are inherent in tackling these militants in that border region generally? It is indeed because these, uh, these groups are uh, stationed in very mountainous areas in Nuristan and Kunar region in eastern Afghanistan. And uh, unfortunately, that the NATO and US troops uh, some time ago uh, uh, withdrew from those areas. So that, that allowed the, uh, these militants to establish their safe havens there. And now they are attacking not just in Pakistan, but have uh, expanded their areas of operation in eastern Afghanistan as well. So this is, this is a very dangerous enemy. I want to ask you uh, about something that was said in, uh, in Pakistan, Ms. Sherry Rahman, um, 
mention this is it was this issue of fighting and talking uh, now it's something that uh, in the report the Jinnah Institute put out is something that a lot of Pakistani foreign policy elites were concerned about that well if you're fighting the Taliban and at the same time you're talking about reconciliation it just doesn't square that doesn't add up how do you respond to that uh, concept that you can not fight uh, the Taliban and talk to them at the same time I think that it's possible to just like continue fighting the Taliban uh, uh, at the same time uh just talking with them. This has been uh, just a practice uh, that in many different parts of the country. But the main issue, as Ms. Rahman mentioned herself, is just lack of clarity. Both the policy of the Afghan government, the Pakistani government, and also the United States. Because all these issues of talks is just talks about talks, and it's just covered in a lot of mystery, that we don't know details of that. And many times in the past it happened that there was ex uh, increasing optimism about the talks between these groups, but uh, later we understood that it, it, it achieved nothing, and many of the uh, past representatives of the Taliban, many seniors, uh, happened to be imposters. Well, this is an interesting point. Before we go over back to Islam, I just want to quickly follow up on that. I mean, again, the, the, the argument from Pakistan as well, you're not going to see any progress on the talks as long as you're fighting them. Do you think that the U.S. policy right now of continuing this counterinsurgency campaign while at the same time putting on uh, signals that it wants to talk. Do you think that either strategy will work, the fighting or the talking, while both of them are still going on? I think that if we mean to uh, talk and reconcile with the senior leadership of the Taliban, they are not ready to, uh, for talks, let alone for any peaceful negotiations and peaceful negotiated settlement of the Afghan war. And they have shown no willingness, and uh, Mullah Omar and also the leadership council based in Quetta have categorically rejected any kind of talks until the foreign uh, forces until leave foreign the country. Leave, right. So, uh, and over the past seven years, we have not achieved anything, and I don't think that this will achieve anything in the short term. That's an interesting point, and we'll talk about uh, this question of how long uh, the forces will be in Afghanistan in a minute. Uh, Mr. Tinvir Aman Khan, I want to come over to you and ask you the same general question. I mean, uh, one of the concerns that are often raised in Pakistan about the U.S. strategy is that talking and fighting at the same time uh, is counterproductive and then neither can be done. But the U.S. side, there's often this, uh, ish, uh, this uh, uh, perception that, well, we need to put the Afghan, uh, the Afghan Taliban in a position, in a weak, weakened position, so that they will be more willing to talk. What's your take on this whole talking versus fighting situation? I think that's the crux of the, of the matter. Now, uh, I think it's a misconception uh, to think or to say that there is a lack of clarity in Pakistan. In fact, there is unprecedented clarity in Pakistan about Afghanistan after a long time. Finally, Pakistan has cut through the fog of illusions, delusions, idle dreams, and uh, embraced a policy which is very realistic, which, which is uh, also very simple. It has two basic objectives. It wants stability in Afghanistan because we can have an enormous uh, trade uh, interaction with Afghanistan, even now, when, when things are so uncertain, so unsettled, uh, there is a turnover of something like $1.75 billion of trade between Pakistan and Afghanistan. So we, we have an enormous potential, and then through Afghanistan with Central Asia and yeah. destinations right. beyond. Some, now, yeah. now, to come back to the question, uh, I think uh, the, the fundamental thing is that uh, we want the United States to take into account Pakistan's concerns. The second concern, uh, which I think uh, has partially been understood, was that uh, for a period the American policy aimed at building up India as a kind of surrogate power beyond the withdrawal of uh, American forces or international forces. Now, I think this, this is what is a matter of great concern to, to Pakistan. Uh, the uh, people in Washington should not forget that Afghanistan has two long borders. One is with Iran. America does not have friendly relations with Iran. In fact, it, it is locked into a hostile relationship. With Pakistan, it has created ambivalence by ignoring uh, or sidelining, marginalizing Pakistan's core interests. I think that these have to be taken into account and then these divergences would disappear 
eventually a solution in Afghanistan would be found in a much closer, greater cooperation between Pakistan and, uh, and America. Now, I think this is important because the divergences now have been identified and they, are, they can easily be reconciled. They're not impossible to reconcile. Right. Uh, you uh, said that uh, after a long time, uh, Pakistanis are very clear. There's been unprecedented clarity on the issue of Afghanistan. So um, do you think that this is also, this concept is uh, merely j uh, a myth that Pakistan uh, wants a regime in Kabul, uh, which was uh, sort of uh, the Taliban regime that it has. It, doesn't, it does not support uh, any longer the Taliban-style regime in Afghanistan. Uh, what are your views on that? Pakistan, as it stands today, has no fascination, no ideological fascination as far as the Taliban are concerned. If at all, we, we are deeply worried about the, uh, what the DPT, Tariqa Taliban in Pakistan are doing and so on and so forth. We have no illusions about the Taliban mm. either. But we have waited for 10 years. Because it said uh, that in order to uh, safeguard its interest yeah. against now, uh, we, India, Pakistan would want a government that support, that yeah. uh, the Taliban support. I think the, the Pakistani objective has been downgraded to a very simple proposition that Pakistan does not want a government in Kabul which is hostile, which would allow its territory to be used for subversion in Pakistan, for cross-border right. attacks and so on and so forth. I think that, that's the basic right. objective. The other is, of course, Pakistan would like to see a regional arrangement hmm. uh, in which Pakistan has a, a role, hmm. a role uh, which, is, which belongs to it hmm. by virtue of 2,500 kilometer long border, ethnicity, common languages, something which, I mean, there is no way that you can separate yeah. Afghanistan and Pakistan ever. And they, they, there would always be that interaction and we want to turn that into an opportunity rather than a peril. Right. Do you think there are some economic issues that Pakistan is also concerned about, Mr. Tanvir Ahmed Khan? For example, uh, foreign aid that should be uh, continued uh, to Afghanistan because uh, many analysts here believe that if that does not happen, the Afghan refugee pro problem could loom large again for Pakistan. I'm, I'm glad you asked this question. You see, Afghanistan at the moment, I mean, billions of dollars have been pumped into Afghanistan. Uh, and its capacity to absorb it in a scientific manner uh, was very limited. So a war economy continues. Now, as the withdrawal takes place and gets deeper and deeper, this economy is going to be, it's become, already become fragile, it will become even more fragile. I think uh, what we want is that uh, there should be a blueprint twofold. All right. One, continued foreign assistance on a large scale for Afghanistan. Secondly, allow Afghanistan to build up its normal potential for trade with all its neighbors, the second string of neighbors, the mm. third string of neighbors, and, and turn uh, the, the pathways, the roads, the communication links in this region These are, of into course, a are network of going peace to play a, and stability. Play a very vital role for Afghanistan's stable future. Mr. Majid, I want to ask you. Um, what uh, role do you think that the United States uh, wants to see uh, Pakistan uh, playing now? Does it want to see uh, Pakistan as a prominent part of the political talks or the reconciliation or the negotiation uh, process uh, with the Taliban in Afghanistan? Well, the United States and also the Afghan government uh, have mentioned repeatedly that Pakistan's role and uh, a negotiated peaceful settlement in Afghanistan is very much vital. Uh, but Mr. Tanvir Ahmad mentioned about Pakistan's uh, security concerns, and, uh, and many of those Pakistani concerns are very much legitimate indeed, that Pakistan wants a friendly uh, government in Kabul, and also uh, Pakistan does not want Afghanistan to be used uh, 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 by any kind of groups or any neighboring countries against the Pakistan's uh, uh, security interests as well. I think these are legitimate uh, interests, but, but I don't see that how these uh, concerns and these uh, uh, objectives could be met just by uh, supporting the Taliban. I think that the policy of uh, just denial does not work anymore. We, we call 
we call the Quetta Shura, Quetta Shura and we call the Haqqani network the Miran Shah Shura for a reason. And, and to say that they do not exist on the Pakistani territory, I think that this is not accurate. And, and also, I don't see that why the Pakistani elites now see the government of President Karzai as hostile, because the government of Afghanistan is very much dependent on Pakistan, not just in the fight against terror, but also economically as well. So it wants very good relations with Pakistan. And in terms of the ethnic balance as well, uh, Mr. Tanvir Ahmad mentioned, Ms. Shahra uh, uh, also mentioned previously that Pakistan wants an inclusive and ethnically balanced government in Afghanistan. But I think that we have the more balanced government in, in Afghanistan in the history. If you see the parliament's composition, 40% of the uh, parliament is uh, the Pashtuns. If you see the president of uh, the Afghanistan is Pashtun. If you see the Afghan army and national police, it's very much ethnically balanced. But if we mean by giving uh, one ethnic group more chance, and by that we mean the Taliban, uh, we have to be clear that the Taliban does not represent the Pashtuns. That's true that most of the Taliban are Pashtuns, but not all Pashtuns are the Taliban. And the Taliban themselves are a very uh, fringe and uh, minority within the Pashtuns and their despised as well. Pakistan often looks at the Taliban and, uh, you know, to be frank, Pakistan looks at Taliban as a way to have leverage in Afghanistan as a way to continue and maintain its interest in, uh, in, in Afghanistan. Um, how then does the United States look at this? I mean, how, how does the United States take on board what on this show we've, we've heard from Ms. Sherry Aman, from Mr. Tanmir Aman, what are very clear Pakistani interests. Uh, you, know, one can, uh, you know, one can debate whether or not the Taliban the right uh, vehicle for that interest, but then how does the United States then take on board Pakistani interests? Well, the United States have set some conditions that, uh, uh, that the Taliban can be uh, included in any future Afghan government. Uh, if they accept the Afghan government and accept the uh, Afghan constitution and also lay down arms and uh, uh, renounce violence and also cut ties with Al-Qaeda. But they, what the evidence just suggests otherwise, we see that uh, especially the Haqqani network, which the Pakistani government sees as a strategic asset, is getting closer and closer to Al-Qaeda. So uh, at this time, it is difficult to accept uh, the Taliban as a legitimate opposition force because of their ties uh, to Al-Qaeda and also terrorism. Right. And also the, the senior leadership of the Taliban, they do not want any government sharing with the Afghan government because they don't see the current Afghan government as legitimate. If we see today's uh, Eid message on their website indeed, they call Afghanistan still as the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. So they uh, give no credibility and legitimacy to the uh, current Afghan government. That's an interesting point. Uh, Vakas, I want to come over to um, Vakas. I have a question of Mr. Tanvir Ahmed. Actually, uh, we only have a few minutes left on our end, but I want to quickly get a perspective of Mr. Ahmed. Um, you know, the, there's this uh, news. There's a lot of news uh, about a strategic agreement between the United States and Afghanistan. Uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the Telegraph UK said that an agreement could be made for U.S. troops to stay in Afghanistan until at least 2024. Now, uh, many are saying that this signals that the United States is looking for a long-term commitment in Afghanistan. How do you look at that? How do you l look at uh, the United States and Afghanistan having this agreement of having U.S. troops there and having bases there? And do you think that can actually address this Pakistani concern about, uh, about U.S. commitment in Afghanistan? A framework uh, would become difficult in Afghanistan. Well, you know, uh, in, in Pakistan, it has always been known that there would be a strong American presence beyond 2014. Uh, we, we are aware uh, of uh, the work that is being done at Bagram, Shindan, a third air base. We are also aware of the fact that uh, some elementary steps have been taken to sign agreements for trainer aircraft for the uh, Afghan Air Force uh, as an auxiliary of the main American sort of, you know, component. Now, uh, this, the continued American presence, I don't think uh, Pakistan would be all that anxious about it. Mm -hmm. But this is not going to be taken lightly. And all the other countries in the region well, too? Iran, or just Iran, Pakistan? for instance. I mean, right. Iran uh, looks at the entire situation um, uh, from a larger perspective. A, a state of siege in, in which uh, Bahrain, uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, other areas, 
Iraq, American presence in Iraq, they're all components of that. Why? Why wouldn't they welcome that Be presence? Because uh, America has not been able to really uh, start a meaningful dialogue with Iran. It's long overdue. All right. All and right. Iran, in the meanwhile, has emerged. Yeah. Emerged as a, yes. as a significant regional player. Right. I'll just come back to you. Uh, Washington's running out of time. I quickly want to uh, use this time uh, to ask Mr. Majid Yareza. Uh, you just heard what Mr. Tanvir Ahmed Khan said to this. And also, uh, many are saying that the military uh, operations in Afghanistan have not been able to uh, bring down the Taliban to negotiate uh, regarding Afghanistan's futures on uh, America's term. Do you agree? How do you uh, look at this comment? Uh, well, I think that uh, if we remember in 1989 when the Russian troops left Afghanistan, still many Pakistani politicians uh, criticized America for abandoning Afghanistan and uh, hold it responsible for the chaos which followed after that. And I find it a bit ironic that now many, many officials in Pakistan now uh, criticize the United States for signing a long-term partnership with the Afghan government. And I believe that a long-term and strategic agreement between Afghanistan and the United States is necessary for stability of Afghanistan and for stability of the region. We know that by the end of the combat mission, in Afghanistan by 2014, the Afghan government will not be able to uh, defend itself against the terrorist group in the region. So there is the need of presence of some of the U.S. forces there uh, to help not only train the Afghan security forces, but also help the counterterrorism issues as well. But but also the there is a need of presence of some of the uh, U.S. forces there. Uh, to combat terrorism even in the tribal regions of Pakistan because uh, now we see that the relationship between the two countries are soaring. Right. Uh, so there is... A quick question before we, uh, before we go out. Uh, it's sort of an insider Washington question. I mean, we heard that, you know, uh, they're talking about extending the U.S. troop presence in Afghanistan through to 2024. Um, but here in Washington, there's a lot of concern about uh, Defense Department spending, there's a lot of concern about the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and the spending that happens because of them. Do you think that uh, sentiment here in Washington and Congress and the media will limit U.S. presence in Afghanistan going forward? Absolutely, but when we are talking about the long-term presence of the U.S. forces in Afghanistan, we are not talking about maintaining the current level of forces there, which is about uh, over 100,000 uh, U.S. troops alone. Uh, plus some 50,000 uh, NATO forces as well. There will be uh, about some between 20 to 25,000 US troops, which will not require that amount of money that we are talking about now. That's very interesting. That's unfortunately all the time we have for here in Washington. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Majid Yar and our guests in Islamabad as well. Uh, Vakas, I'll leave it to you to wrap up the show on your end. But from here in Washington, it's good night. Reza, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Majid, there as well. Uh, very briefly, we've got a couple of minutes left, Mr. Khan. So uh, one thing uh, that appears after the discussion is that Pakistan feels that it has done enough uh, on the military front of uh, bringing some sort of stability uh, to Afghanistan and perhaps uh, play a more important role in the negotiation process. Uh, but the United States appears uh, to limit Pakistan's role to the military level. Do you agree? I think that would be a great mistake. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that the real challenge today, I mean, if Afghanistan could get rid of the Taliban, uh, Americans had 10 years. And it's not Pakistan which is urging America to talk to the Taliban. There are voices in Washington, there are voices all over the United States that insist that we must really talk to the Taliban. And that is where an exploration has begun. So far, we, we have not really got uh, very far. We haven't got very far, Americans haven't got very far. The reason for that is that the Taliban know that they can be drawn into uh, a negotiating process and destroyed. So they want to be sure of certain things before. Uh, you see, if, if, if uh, there is no agreement within their ranks, if the sh uh, Shura in Kuwait or whatever it is, if they enter, go into talks and uh, the talks are not really fruitful. Right. And uh, there would be a, an outcry, sellout, and this and that. They would find it very difficult to hold together their 
uh, forces. Yes. And this reconciliation is the biggest challenge, as you so said. I think we and have to do a lot of preparatory work. Yeah, and it could take a long time. It could take a long time. And, and it would also require, as we uh, found out in tonight's episode, that lots of clarity uh, on uh, the policy towards Afghanistan is required from all the countries that have a stake uh, there. I thank my guest, Mr. Tanvir Ahmed Khan, uh, former Foreign Secretary, who joined me here in Islamabad studios. Also, Ms. Sherry Rahman, former Foreign Minister, who joined us from Karachi. Special thank you to Mr. Ahmed K. Majidyar, Raza Nakwi, my colleague from Voice of America, and the entire team there. My name is Vakas Rafiq. Thank you so much for watching the platform. Good night.